Hello everyone and welcome to CodeCast by STL Tech Talk, where we'll be giving you instructional, informative, unique, and insightful commentary on programming code and technology. From robots to roadhouses, we will be bringing you the content you want and need. My name is JJ Hammond, and of course, I'm joined tonight by two coding experts. Up first, our guest of the evening. He is passionate about software quality, and by day he works relentlessly in finding continuous improvement opportunities using tools like Lean and Six Sigma at Monsanto. In his career, he has had the roles of software developer, dev lead, tester, and test lead, and has worked for companies like GE, GM, Anheuser-Busch, Boeing, and the Mac Business Unit for Microsoft. By night, he wears multiple hats. He is co-founder and principal developer at Inertia.com. Apple correspondent for us at STL Tech Talk, hobbyist photographer, father of one, and a devoted husband. He likes to share his love of tech wherever he goes, and the force is strong with this one. Say hello, Alejandro Ramirez. Hey, guys. Nice to be here. Very excited. Very excited. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for being on, man. As always, it's a pleasure to have somebody as pumped as uh, me uh, on the uh, on the other side. Uh, also, we uh, cannot do this show, however, without my good friend. Uh, the world is a special place with him, in and because of it, striving to distribute development knowledge to development knowledges to the masses, and has spent the last 20 years architecting and implementing highly scalable ASP.NET applications throughout the Twin Cities. And national speaker. Say hello, Gus Emery. Hey, everyone. Alejandro, thanks for joining us. It's going to be a fun fun show. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. And uh, Gus, as always, thank you from me to you for all, uh, always being on the show. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, hashtag CodeCast. It's real easy. It's not hard. There should be more people subscribing tonight, in fact. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, forward slash SCL Tech Talk. You can find us on Google Plus the same way. I suggest subscribing to our YouTube channel so that you can see all of our CodeCasts. Also, if you like uh, listening to this stuff or uh, driving to work or driving home or whatever the case may be is, follow us on iTunes, Stitcher, Windows Phone, TuneIn Radio, or you can listen directly uh, from the site. Also, you can download Andy Long's application for our uh, website, which is uh, uh, STL Tech Talk on the Windows Phone store. Andy Long is an awesome developer. Alejandro and I uh, and Andy are all working on the Windows 8.1 and the Windows Phone 8.1 apps for the, uh, for the STL Tech Talk app, as well as iOS and Android. So it's going to be hot when that launches. Don't forget to visit stltechtalk.com to keep up with our tech news, podcasts, codecast, Find out how you can advertise with us or hire us to consult you on your technological needs. And don't forget that you can act, uh, excuse me, interact with the show by sending us feedback to podcast at stltechtalk.com. And if you're watching us live, you can ask us questions via the chat room, and we'll do our best to answer those questions in a timely manner. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get the uh, show kicked off first uh, with the question to Alejandro. What got you interested in technology, my friend? I think I blame my dad. Since I was in elementary school, I, uh, he brought the first computer home. And first, you know, it was video games, just playing with the computer. When I was old enough, I started programming in BASIC on a Commodore 16. And just as, as technology continued to grow, my dad kept changing the computers. They kept getting smaller. And we went from monochromes to color, actually from green to amber or vice versa, and then color. Um, it's it's a different world today. My son has been exposed to technology since age zero, which is which is a I used to brag that oh I I was exposed since a very early age, but I think kids nowadays have it a very different way, uh, and I think that's that's basically what drove me to love technology. I was surrounded by it since a, a, a very early age. Awesome, very cool, very cool. So what was your uh, what was your first device that you actually did some coding on? The Commodore 16 came preloaded with BASIC, and you had the memory on the device, or you can buy a data set, which was basically a tape, a cassette, and you will put it in the recorder, and you could write your programs and write them there. And um, From there, I think I moved to Visual BASIC for Windows 3.1 some Pascal in college, then uh, Fox Pro for Windows, then Visual Basic 5, Visual Basic 6. Then once I graduated from college, uh, I work on HTML, JavaScript, a bit of Java, but more from the, the software testing side. 
And I think that my story is more of a comeback developer because I was a developer the first, uh, well, two years before I graduated and my first three years after graduation. When the dot-com and the internet came to be, I was into software testing. And so for the longest time, I wanted to get back into development. And now with the mobile revolution, I think I got my, my chance at doing development. So I started about a year, year and a half ago trying to catch up. And, and so it's, a, it's been a really interesting journey, especially because I have been a tester and I have been complaining about developers, this developers, that. And now that I'm a developer, again, I start seeing the things that I was complaining about that, well, now I think I know why they do those things. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, there's a lot of knowledge here on on the show tonight, uh, as there is every uh, uh, show. But uh, there's a lot that I want Gus to ask um, ask you from a developer uh, perspective. You know, because uh, you guys both spoke at last year's dot net uh, days, St. Louis days of dot net. So really curious, Gus. What's your question for Alejandro? Well, well, I'm going to start out with something that you just brought up. And uh, what's the worst part of software testing to you? Writing test cases, I, I think that's the, the, the most boring task of, of being a tester. It's just, it seems like it's throwaway. I, the, the eight or so many years that I spent going from junior tester to senior tester, I think that the, the part that I was always trying to find out how we could get better at was just all those test cases because you wrote all these documents. In some places, it was a Word document. Some other places, we were using Quality Center or Rational. And it just seems like we had to constantly go back to those, and there was very little dynamism on on how to keep them up to date easily. They they seem to sometimes be too strict, and this is of course waterfall and spiral methodologies. When agile came to be, people started getting away from that, and and it became more of a task where I started departing from testing really pursuing how do I actually bring quality into software development. Testing does not bring quality. You're just lucky that you find bugs and defects in, in code. But the, the truth is that the, the defects are already there. You're just lucky to find them. So that pursuit of how do I really work on quality took me to work upstream to, to work at the early inception phases. So when Agile came to be, it was kind of the, the natural way to now work across functions and iterations and really work on building good quality code from the ground up. Ah, I nice. gotcha. So, so do you see Agile as being a really good way to develop today as a tester? Or did you find it kind of hard to step into that Agile uh, you know, mindset as a tester when you were testing, that is? So my first exposure to Agile was when I was working at Microsoft. I came from many years of, of waterfall. And so first it was a shock because you're so used to the throw, throw it over the wall mentality to a kind of a lockdown of some places may have some reviews that you get to see the, the technical design ahead of time. But in this case, it was like everybody goes into the swimming pool at the same time. And so it demands that you catch up a lot quicker you also have to wear many hats as opposed to being just like a black box tester or a gray box tester. You actually have to, to own more of your product as a whole, uh, even if you're just uh, uh, playing the role of a tester. So it was challenging because it, it forced you to get out of that comfort zone, the, the defects, the bugs, and, and really play a more active role in, in bringing up the, the quality. Uh, so help the development team and, and everybody around to build that quality into the product. So I like Agile. I'm curious to see what's what's coming after. Um, I think it's we're always evolving. Yeah, it's called chaos next. Everyone goes <laughs> the chaos theory. Yeah, all, we're going to see like people come to work and in in you know the the the, the Buddha kind of um, like robes. It all has a reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That'd be awesome. Well, what it's happened if you if you if you see what happened with Agile, the, the product development teams became Agile, but everybody around them was still working in a waterfall model. And so then suddenly they found out that they couldn't release as fast as they wanted. If you read case studies like Etsy, it took them about eight years to go to the culture that is called DevOps. Yep. Which is basically the agilization of the release and continuous build process. 
Yep, exactly. And and it is not as easy to do that, right? I mean, yep. that, that is the stumbling point in most organizations, especially when it comes around production. But mm -hmm. let's let's switch this into what we're actually talking about. What drove you to, like, iOS development? Well, that's an excellent question because I, I grew up in a Windows house. My dad had Windows. Actually, we started with Microsoft operating system since DOS 5.0. Ooh. And really, the, the love affair with the Mac came in around 2001 with, when Mac OS X came to exist. When I was in college, we had some Macs. The truth is nobody used them. We have the Power Macs. They were expensive. I didn't have one at home, so I tinkered with them a couple of times. But I, it wasn't just, you know, it was interesting, but there was not enough for me to, to do. All of the courses that we were taking didn't cover anything Mac. So... Uh, when Mac OS X came to be, I had been exposed to Linux, so I like to think of Mac OS as the sexiest incarnation of Unix ever. And it's also one of the most user-friendly. I have played that with, with Linux, like I said, but it was really Mac OS X that, that caught my eye, the swivel iMac, if you remember, that looks like an R2-D2 head with a screen on top. That <laughs> I'm like, I have to have that Mac. And I went and got one and started just playing with it. And um, I tried looking into software development when I first opened Xcode, which came with, with the Mac in a separate DVD. That thing was just harder than you know what. I, I was kind of like, yeah, i probably look at this in the future. But but it was truthfully the, the um, Mac OS X operating system that, that got me there. For iOS, for the mobile platform, it was just kind of a natural progression because once you get into an ecosystem, you first start with the computers, then the first iPod came out. I bought an iPod. It was an 8-gig iPod, so it was kind of the first generation, and it plugged really nicely with my iMac. I was uh, going to college for my master's degree, so I carried that as, a, as an external hard drive to save all my homework, and everybody in the university had Mac, so I was... It was now, you know, there was a more modern version of Office for Mac. Um, and then, of course, the, the, I, the iPod led to the iPhone eventually. And when, when I was working at Microsoft at the Mac business unit, I think all of this experience working with Macintoshes on, on the side and at home converted my wife to Mac. She's still a Mac uh, zealot, if you will, probably more than I am at some point. And, um, and so when, when I applied for the job at the Mac Boo, um, it was it was just really cool that that I got the job. Um, it, it was just a whole other layer of of learning about the the internals of of Mac. And that year, when I was there in 2007, that's when the iPhone came out. Everybody who was working on Office 2008, we all got a, a free iPhone as our ship gift. That'll work. That'll yeah. Work. So. Uh, and at that point, again, I opened up again Xcode and started looking at that, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that when I get into my presentation, but um, but I, I was curious ever since to what it will be like developing, because I was a heavy Visual Basic developer, and I was kind of expecting uh, that same... Just know the thing or two about Visual Basic. Uh, just a little. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, so now that you mentioned Xcode and Visual Basic and whatnot, why don't you give us a little bit of a background on Xcode, real quick? Yep. Yeah. So, I want to take um, half a step even back further because um, I actually facilitate a couple of study groups, and the one, the number one question that people ask is, "What do I need to develop apps for iOS?" And believe it or not, if you want to do native apps, you need to have a Mac. And a lot of people don't expect that you have to have a Mac. In this modern day and age, you know, you can develop Android apps on Mac or Linux or Windows. And so I think people mm -hmm. kind of were expecting the same thing. Unfortunately, Xcode, which is the, the main IDE to develop iOS apps, only runs on, on, on your Mac. And uh, so you have to have a Mac. I run it on a Mac Mini. I run it on a MacBook Pro. It... it can get a little bit slow if you don't have a dedicated graphics card, but for the most part, you don't have to spend a lot of money on a development machine to, to make it run. Right. So that's that's kind of put it out there. Uh, you need a Mac. There are other ways. I'm not going to talk about those tonight. I'm going to go with the native code. The <laughs> other thing that people think is that you need to pay money to develop. Well, Xcode is free. It used to come bundled in your computer. Now you just go to the App Store and download it. It's completely free. 
it has a simulator just like Visual Studio and Android development, the Android development environment. So you can develop your app and test it entirely on the included simulators, which have built-in simulators for both iPad and iPhone in their different screen resolutions and retina and non-retina. Um, when you want to test in a physical device, and when you want to publish, then you have to purchase an Apple development program subscription, which is $100 a year. And once you publish your app, if you want to keep your app on the marketplace, on the App Store, you have to pay those recurring fee of, of $100. Gotcha. Uh, okay. gotcha. Yeah, the language that, that Xcode uses is Objective-C, which is a subset of C. And the nomenclature, the syntax is kind of weird. And if you're used to, to other languages, I, I think this this will probably be the one with the slightly longer learning curve just because you have to get used to the strange uh, method, the nominations, and how you call things and how you use uh, parameters in a function. <laughs> but other than that, it uses primarily, it's built on the NVC pattern. So okay. That's a very common pattern that I think started or got really popular with struts back in mm -hmm. in the early 2000s, um, and now it's pretty much built into everything. So yeah, that <clears throat> that actually um, came out of Xerox Park in 1979. So I mean, that's that's how old that that framework is. So wow, yeah. How's yep. that for a history lesson, fellas? <laughs> Take note. I can share a slide in a minute if you guys want to see it. <laughs> you know, I'm yep. good. I'm good. But uh, anyway, let, let, enough about talking, Alejandro. Why don't you show us what you got? Show let's, us what you made of, uh, Alejandro. Show us what you made of. All right. Yeah. So before I share my screen, I just want to tell you a couple more things about Xcode and iOS development in general. So it is all fully object-oriented programming. So if you guys, I know in our audience we have a lot of aspiring developers and we young do. college graduates. If you want to get into iOS development, Object-oriented object programming is definitely going to help you. If you haven't had much of OOP, it might be a little bit of a, a learning curve, but just pick up one of those uh, thinking in Java books or thinking in C++, and, and then you should be fine. A, a C book will probably also suffice because the nomenclature, the syntax of Objective-C is basically C. You can do everything that you can do in C in Objective-C and more. So, Very cool. Some of the highlights of iOS, as any other framework, you have multiple layers, and all of them are kind of a black box. You just tap into them to use different services. So this is very similar to any other operating systems like Windows or Android. So you can access core services. You can access a media layer to take pictures or play audio. You can also, of course, interact with the Coco Touch, which is the multi-touch, the motions, all of the image manipulation that comes with the interaction with the user. And like I said, it's built heavily on MVC. I'm going to show you a, a quick demo of, of what that looks like in practice. Um, MVC is, stands for Model View Controller, for those of you who don't know. It's also called NVP for Model View Presenter. And what that means is three big components. The model is the logic of your app. It's not the look. And that basically means if, if you're writing a game, well, the, the logic of the game is your model. If you're accessing data, that's your model. The controller part, the, the C of the MVC or Presenter, is that other piece that controls how your logic is presented to the user. And of course, the view is the user interface. And the nice thing about MVC, and I know I'm preaching to the choir to a lot of you, sorry for the history lesson repeat, but for those of you guys who are, who are aspiring and those that are in your company. This is what we're here for, Alejandro. This is what we're here for. So give it to us. Give it to us. Come on. All right. So, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I was <laughs> going to tell you on, on the MVC. So, the, the nice thing of, of using MVC is that it really separates the, the three primary layers. So if you think about it, in iOS, you have the ability to build apps that are called universal, that basically the same app code can run on an iPad and an iPhone. And all you should have to change is the user interface, because, of course, in the iPad, you have a lot more screen than you have on an iPhone. And so by using an MVC pattern, 
you can have your model being the same thing. You have the same game logic if you're doing Angry Birds. You don't have to write Angry Birds just for the iPad and rewrite it for I iPhone. So the controller is the piece that is going to control what uh, or, or designate, help you designate what goes where, which controls to render where, how to stretch on a larger screen. And so it's, it's pretty simple. You, you'll get a hang of it really quickly. There's some rules, and I'm not going to get into that. If you are more interested than, um, if you're if you're more interested in learning about iOS, please contact me after this, and I'll be more than happy to get you started with iOS development. Mm -hmm. And we can go over more details, and I can give you some recommendations on which courses, free courses to take, what books to read, and and so forth. So let's let get to it, man. Yeah, awesome. let me open. Mm -hmm. Alejandro, before, uh, before you share that, let me just show, uh, show something here really quick. Oh, yes, please. Um, here's my uh, desktop. Let me know when you can see that. Can you guys see that or not? Yep. Okay. That is the actual creator of uh, MVC. Wow. And uh, it was originally called the Thing Model View Editor. I've actually um, sent and received a couple of emails from him over the years, so I just wanted to show that because I that's literally that's the cool. history lesson right there. That, that is cool. awesome. So, sorry, I'm off now. No, okay. no, no, you know, like I mentioned before, the first time I became familiar with it was when I was working with a Struts project, and that's like yep. 2001, so... Yep, and that would have been where it would have come back in into play, I believe. Quite a gap, quite a gap. So let me now do my screen sharing. And can you see my desktop? Yep. OK, so I have to minimize this guy, right? Yep, please. So I'm going to open Xcode, and I'm going to create a new project. I'll show you a couple of project samples that I have. but. So right out of the box, again, no money paid other than your Mac. Um, you have a list of templates. And you can pick either to start with an empty application, which I honestly never rarely use, unless you're writing an app from scratch, like a video game, in which you have to create the, the UI from scratch. But if you want to just develop pretty much any app that follows a model similar to any other apps that you've seen. I suggest you pick the single view application. The next pick will be the master detail. That's the typical navigation that goes from, if you picture a, an email application, you have a list of emails, you tap on an email, and you go to another view that has the, the email text and you can go back and forth. So that's kind of the master detail. And it all starts really nicely uh, with, with a lot of really nicely generated code for you. So that's why I, I try not to use the empty app, because then you really start from scratch. So single view app will probably give you the most bang for your buck. You can notice something here that there's iOS and Mac OS X. So yes, with Xcode, you can also write apps for Mac. However, the subscription for developing apps for OS X is separate from that of iOS. So if you want to develop for both, you have to pay 100 bucks for each. So it doesn't include both, which is kind of a bummer. That's some good information to know for sure. And so once um, you pick your template here, you put some information here like any other project. So I'm going to call this the STL Tech Talk Codecast Demo. How's that for an app name? That's probably too long. I'm just going to call it Codecast. There we go. Organization name. I have inertia and company identifier. It's going to read this from your computer's defaults. It might come with something completely different, just your first name. And if you put a company name, Otherwise, you can change it. It's completely editable. That usually is the reverse um, naming convention. So just kind of let it be. It makes your life simpler. So as you can see, the bundle identifier is com.inertia.codecast. You can prefix all of your classes, which I suggest you do. So I'm just going to prefix my classes with codecast. 
So when my view controller is generated for me, it's going to be called CodeCast view controller because that's the main entry point into the app. Next, you can choose to do iPad or iPhone or both. In this case, I'm going to go with an iPhone app. I'm going to click Next. It's going to ask you where you want to put it. I have a little folder here. And you can create a local Git repository, which you can sync to an actual GitHub repository or a subversion repository or other things. Uh, regardless of what your choice is, if you're not using an online repository, I, I suggest at least do the local one. There's been situations where you can screw up some code and you want to get back to the last or the, the last known version that was working, and, and that might save you a little bit. So if you haven't really tinkered with source control, I suggest you talk to someone to just get the basics, because that, that's really, really handy. So here is the first page that is presented to you once you created a brand new project. Uh, can you guys look at this OK? Is the text too small? Should I change my resolution, or is this OK? I think it's good on okay. my end. Yeah. All right. So you, you can see there's a whole bunch of information here. The defaults are pretty handy. If you keep your Xcode up to date, at some point, like every other framework or every other IDE, it points to the latest and greatest. So in this case, it's pointing to iOS 7.1. If for other reasons you want to target an earlier version, like I, you want to do iOS six you can pick this now your compiler is going to complain about certain things if you're targeting an earlier version so you may have to end up doing some checks like oh if it's iOS 7 then do this or if it's iOS 6 then do that because you know they deprecate or deactivate some methods and functions or change the syntax and you have to make sure that if if somebody is running one version of iOS, they don't get stuck because that um, piece of code is not going to work. So I, iOS and, and iPhone in general, people are pretty quick to adopt the latest version. So you're pretty safe if you just target the latest one. Um, when there are major changes, like from 6 to 7, from 7 to 8, there is a bit of a pause. People kind of want to wait to see that there's no bugs. But then they kind of jump in pretty quickly, quicker than most other platforms. So I'll say you'll probably be safe. So don't worry too much about that. Here, again, you can change that original option. So if you wonder, oh, but I wanted to do an iPad app, well, you can change it here. Now, it, it generated some code for you at the beginning, so you may have to do some other tweaking. But here's, here's kind of like your project properties, if, if you will. And there's a lot more here once you read the documentation. Um, then, then you can look at that. The most important part here, I think, it's the device orientation. So in this case, I am going to say that I'm going to leave it as is. It's supporting both portrait and land landscape. And it gives you other options. Um, you go up here to the project. Here's the target, because you can target an iPhone, you can target an iPad, and you're going to have multiple entries here. But here at the top, you can go back and make some changes for debug versus releases. This is probably more advanced, but let me get to, to the main piece. So on the left-hand side of Xcode, this is kind of like the project hierarchy in Visual Studio, if you have seen that, or in mm -hmm. Eclipse. So at the top is your project name. So if you want to go back to your project properties and you were tinkering somewhere else, you can just click on that, and that's your project properties. Now, when we pick the... Class prefix, we call it CodeCast. So every file that was generated automatically for us is prefixed with that name. So you can see that we have an app delegate and a view controller prefixed with CodeCast. One of the interesting things of Objective-C and Xcode development is that the files are split into two, or, or your classes, excuse me, are split into two files. There is the header file that has all of your public interfaces, basically in a class of any kind, whether it's a controller class or a model class. This is where you put everything that you want exposed to interact with other objects in your program. The M file, which stands for implementation, 
that is where you put all of the logic that goes into that class. That's where you can put local variables and in Xcode you call them properties and you can have local properties, you can have public properties. Another thing that is really nice, this is the, the cake and this is something that wasn't here at the beginning of time. Here's the storyboard and you can see I'm on my MacBook Pro and it can get a little bit pokey. Uh, but it's there. So here is your canvas, your blank application. Right now there is nothing. It's just an iPhone, a blank iPhone app. I can run this just as is, and by default it goes to the iPhone Retina 3.5 inch, which is the iPhone 4. And here's the simulator, and there's my white nothing. And so I, I'm zooming in on the simulator. And as you can see, it doesn't look more like an iPad than an iPhone, but if yeah, I... That's interesting. If I switch the simulator to a different device, I think some of them actually have the edge of, of the iPhone. Let me see if this is it. No. I guess it's because it's the retina. Sure. Yeah, but anyway, um, doesn't really matter what, what you really need to notice here with the simulator is you have some really cool operations that you can do on the simulator. Here's the simulator menus. So you can rotate the device. You can shake it. It doesn't shake, in the, the, but it simulates the shake gesture. And you can push the home button. So can click back on my app and it goes back here and I can rotate it as much as I want upside down and I don't have the upside down orientation supported so when I go the other way my app doesn't rotate I think you've noticed that in some apps that certain orientations are not supported so pretty straightforward um, a couple of other really cool highlights and features of Xcode you have this hierarchical view of your storyboard. So right now, right at right this moment, the only thing that you can see here is a view, which is a, the main container. If I go back here and I start adding some objects, like let's say a button, and if you don't want to scroll through all of this, you can just search for a button, and I can just drag a button right here. And remember, this is iOS 7, so the interface is flat, so this looks like a hyperlink, but hey, it's a button. <laughs> I right. swear, it's a button. Um, and there's other really neat controls. You can add a table, and, well, I, I won't get into so much of that, but uh, just, just for some eye candy, I'm going to just drag a couple of different controls. Here's a text field. Here is a slider and a switch. And so once I rerun this, it's kind of like Visual Basic. You just drag and drop and it's all pretty much ready for you to do anything. Here's my keyboard. And uh, the nice thing about this keyboard is you have to programmatically get rid of it. So now I'm stuck with a keyboard that won't go away. So you, you get the, the idea. So I'm going to Exit for now. I'm going to leave it here. I'm going to get rid of this guy because I don't want to get stuck with that text while I do the demo. So just like every other IDE, and again, the biggest change, I think, is that now it's the easiest time to build apps for iOS. This graphic user interface used to be a separate app code called um, Interface Builder. Now it's all built into a single app called Xcode. But in the past, you had to open a separate app, do all of your UI, and then come back here. So that was kind of a pain and uh, I, quite a bit confusing, actually. So now I can just select, let's say, this button and go here to the properties. And I can change the text size and the font. So if I want to make it, if I want to make the text bigger, I have to make my control bigger, too, because the text is now a lot bigger. So I can. I, you can change the text color and gives you all of the system colors because the iPhone has themes or pre-built in system colors rather so now it's black you can just put it back to the default of blue 
which is the iOS 7 user interface. That, of course, is just a button, so that's, that's very simple. The thing I wanted you to see is that now that I have the hierarchical view on the left, I see that there is a button underneath there. So let's make it a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to look for a navigation bar. So if I drop this at the top, now I have a title for that window, which is called Codecast Main Page. And I can also put a little button there that does something like, I don't know, save or whatever you can picture. Nice. Just seeing how the app is starting to take place. There's also a toolbar that goes at the bottom. And I have to... You get into this pickle, but oh, I cannot select my button. You just go here to the hierarchy, pick the button. I'm going to move it to the top of all of the other navigation elements so I can drag it. Yeah. I think that's not what I intended to do. Okay, undo. All right, button. Where did my button go? Oh, it's over here. Ah, the joy of iOS development, right? <laughs> and so, okay. So I put it all back to what it was. I think it's centered for the most part. And one thing that you notice is as I'm dragging things around, there's all of these constraints. So this, if you want to get your app published, Apple is very picky about leaving enough space for things, making buttons big enough for a button for a finger to press on them. So as you're dragging things around, if you're cramming your UI with a lot of stuff, just kind of look for these constraints as you start dragging things around. Just just look at where it says, hey, you should probably stop right here. Well, yeah, I don't want it to overlap with the border, so I'm just going to put it down here. But I don't want to go past this because Apple may say, ah, 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 you're doing bad design. And they are famous for being picky like that. So just some, some of the things you want to know. Um, this is pretty handy. Like every other place, you can control and control C, control V, just paste controls and create as many as you want if you already configured things. So it's, it's pretty simple to use. And now, as you can see, I have all of these items here. You can do multi-select, and I want to delete them. Or oops, control Z, don't, don't delete. So this, this is starting to look a little bit more interesting, maybe. Um, how about I want to look at the code that is inside here to do to make it do something like if I press the button, can I make it do something interesting? So here is one of my favorite things of Xcode. I'm gonna have to make this a little bigger. And uh, the top, you see this little butler-like icon. That's the assistant editor, and that's that's really your best friend. Whenever you select something on this left window, because what you really have is a split window of two elements, whatever I happen to select on this window, the assistant is going to try to find the matching code for that piece. So in this case, I have the view controller, and it pick automatically for me the CodeCast view controller implementation file. So I can start just coding right away. Now, if on this side I want to change to the header file, I'm going to pick the header file of the app delegate. The right side automatically chooses the counterpart of the implementation file. So again, pick the header file on the left, and it chooses to show me the implementation file on the right. You can do other things. If you want to look at different files, you can turn this off and say, you know, I just want to manually pick a different file because I want to compare two files. So I'm looking at the view controller header and I want to look at the delegate header at the same time. So now you're manually handling this. So very handy feature to use. When you get tired of this guy, just go back here to this upper section and you want to work on one window at a time. Maybe you're working on your storyboard and the storyboards can get really complicated as you, draw, uh, as you drag a lot of windows then that's going to start happening. So let's add another view, which is kind of the, the big next frontier that, oh my god, I have my app in one window, but I want to do something else. So I'm going to show you really quickly how to 
drag another view and navigate to the other view. And that, I think, solves 80% of your starting problems with iOS, and that's the biggest takeaway of tonight. You already saw how to drag controls, how to name your app, how easy it is to, to lay things around. So now here's the biggest frontier. Let's look for a UI view controller. Now, you're going to notice that there is a view and a view controller. A view can live inside a storyboard, so I can drag a view inside here and then put some stuff in here. It acts like a container. So inside that view, I can have an image, for example. And as you can see, it acts as the control as the container of that image. The image resize to that view. And I'm going to say, hey, this image is going to be... I don't have any images, so let me pick something really quickly. I'm going to go here to my pictures. And... Embarrassing picture of my brother. Let me see if there's something more decent. So let's just say I want to add this file. So I'm going to make a copy here on my desktop for now. So the good way of adding files is to just drag and drop it to some directory that you choose. And it's going to ask you, you want a copy, you always want to say yes, because otherwise it's going to point to your local reference. And then when you publish, that file is going to be missing because it's looking for the equivalent of C colon slash my documents. So right. you, want <laughs> you don't want that. No, you don't want that. Yeah, so you want to copy that. I'm going to copy it. And it's going to be right here. And you can create folders to organize that. So let's really quickly just say, I'm going to create a new group called images. And I am going to put that image in there. And you can drag that folder. It doesn't really sort it. It doesn't force the sorting alphabetically, so you can actually move them around. And it's going to find it. This is just logical. So when I go back to the storyboard, and I say, hey, I need an image, it's going to look through your entire collection of images. And it's not going to show you a horribly boring path. So hey, I want that. So there it is. Pretty simple. Um, OK, so we were adding another view. And so now that you saw what a view is, it's a container. And views have def certain properties, special properties that you can do. You can animate views and, and so forth. Uh, you can read more about that documentation if, if you want to see what else you can do. But a view controller is the container, is, is the container that can be navigated to. Because, again, we are in an MVC-based design pattern. This is the, 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 the view. We have the matching controller code. We haven't really written any logic, so right now I guess we have like M C no, uh, or VC, excuse me, no model. But so if I want to add another MVC, I drag this. Now that's empty. There is no code that has been generated. So by default, if I look at the inspector, this is going to refer to the built-in Xcode library that defines what a view controller is. And you cannot change this code because, or you should, well, actually, I have it in manual here. Let me go automatic. So this is UI view controller.h, but this is the UI kit implementation. You don't want to mess that code because that's the, the uh, inherited uh, parent definition of a UI view controller. You really want to create your own version of that. So. Let's say that I want to create a very simple app that pretend this is the main menu, and then you want to navigate to a couple of options. So I'm going to have one page here. I'm going to have another page here. And to you can zoom out and zoom in. There's some controls right here to organize your chaos. Um, and so this equal button here kind of shows you your whole app, and then you can pick one item click on that again, and it brings the focus to that spot. So now I have a slightly more complicated application. So I'm going to make this button here go to top, and I'm going to make a copy of this guy, and I'm going to call it down. And so if all I want to do is for that button to navigate to that, it's freaking simple. All I have to do is I select this button, I control 
I press the control key, I drag, I release, and it says, oh, you're doing an action segue, which means I want to push or I want to invoke another view, and I'm going to use the push uh, mechanism, which I'm going to show you what push means, but before we get to that, we probably want to make sure there's some way to get back. So before I get to that, I'm going to drag, control drag, release, it's another push, and just so that we know where we are, I'm going to show you, I'm going to call, I'm going to go for a label, and I'm going to say this is the top window, and this is the down window. And so when I click on my simulator, <clears throat> excuse me, if I click on that button, oh, what happened here? I pick a different simulator. So it's, I started designing an app for a taller iPhone. So I'm going to go back to the 4-inch and run it again. Here's my new simulator, taller. OK, we're back to where we were. So if I click top, pay attention to the animation. That's why it's called push. Ah. OK. Yeah, I, I skipped that step. I apologize. Let me go back. All right, you cranky pants. So it's, it's a navigational element that you have to add. So in addition to doing that, this is what's called a, a segue, a push segue. So I have to say, you know, I'm going to put it go. Product. Am I still running the simulator or did I stop it? No, I think it's been stopped. Okay, here, embed in navigation controller. So this is kind of a container that is the parent that says everything after you kind of follows a hierarchy. So it's navigatable. Um, so now when I go back here and I try to push from one thing to another, I get this navigation for free. Nice. I didn't have to add a back button. So the first time when it crashed was because it said, hey, you're just kind of calling somebody, but I'm going to get stuck. So the thing that you also get for free with the embedded navigation controller, if you remember, we used to have this title in the background. Well, the navigation controller already gives you a title. So I don't have to have this title right here. So I'm going to select this window, go back to my hierarchy, and select my navigation bar, and delete it. And here's the one that I'm inheriting from this parent navigation controller, so I can change the title and say code cast. I can do the same here, so instead of having this indicator that says top window here, I can just double click on this title and say Co uh, top. If you got here to the right hand side on properties, you can even add a subtitle. I'm sure you've seen some navigation. Now, this is taking an awful lot of space. You can actually tweak your code to get rid of the top uh, display if you, don't, if you want to take more advantage of the real estate. Um, I'm going to move things just a little bit down here. And here, same thing. I'm just going to call it below, not down. And all right. So that's a pretty simple way of building navigation. And really, because you get all of those elements for free, you don't have to figure out, how do I get back from here to here? How do I do all of the navigation? Because when I just click there, I get this nice. navigation back. And as you can see, it's called push because it's pushing it to the side. On the iPad, you have other options. You can put screens on top of other screens. Um, Where the background is kind of ghosted, so to speak. Yep. Yeah, and I'm going to... I don't think I have one here that I can 
show you really quickly, but because um, we're we're almost out of time. But it will be basically this segue element that you see here, the arrow that matches or that joins this two, has mm -hmm. a style, and so a model will kind of float on top of here. In the iPhone, it behaves a little bit strangely. So on the iPad, I think it's a lot more um, in intuitive. It just looks like a form that floats on top of your other window. So here, it, it still takes the whole screen, and you have to manually uh, close it. So if I wanted to to do something to close it, just so that you get a sneak look at, at code, I'm Selecting this guy, I'm going to resize the screen, scroll a little bit to the right. This is the, the custom code. So to add a new class, I'm going to call this new class really quickly. It's an Objective-C class, and I'm not, I don't want to call it code cast. It's already a code cast, so I'm going to call this the top window view controller. It's of type UI view controller. Next, it's going to ask you where you want to save it. You leave it alone. Don't mess with the file or directory. Create it. And so it created top window H and M files. So now all I have to do is go back to my UI and say, hey, this, this uh, view, I'm going to go here in this options and give it a custom class of the top window view controller. So now instead of seeing all that code, I have my template here ready for me to code, and I'm going to go to the implementation file, and I'm going to give this guy a button, and this button is going to help me dismiss that, and here's the other cool thing that you can do with iOS, which is extremely easy. How do you link an action in the view to code? Well, so... I'm going to go to the implementation file, and to make this button run an action for me, I just do control, I select the button, I control drag, I release, and I say this is the push me button click event. You can name it whatever you want. I'm going to say specifically that it's a UI button, and it's the touch up inside. Everything else is just peachy, so don't, don't, Change anything, connect. And now, if I hover over this piece, I can see that, oh, this action is connected to that element in the UI. That's very cool. That is very cool. And all you have to do here is to do something like dismiss self dot, is it self? Um, can remember right now from memory. There's a, a, a function to this destination view controller no I, I'll have to remember I think you you um, you call a, a sub a super class to to dismiss this but let me find a, an app that I'm working on just to give you an example of something that looks a little bit nicer um, but here you can write any any type of code just to give you an idea of what Xcode syntax looks like. So if you are writing a method for, let's say, you want to change the text of that label. So to be able to change properties on an element, I have to go to the header file and turn this into an outlet, which means it's a object in the UI that can receive uh, or that can be talked to. So same deal, I control drag. And I'm gonna call this the label. Connect. I gotta say that's 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 pretty neat from a UI standpoint. Being able yeah. to kind of have that um, reminds me a lot of Visual Basic. Yeah, exactly. So now I have a public property called the label, which is an outlet, which means I can talk to it from my controller class. So if I go to the view and I say, "Hey, when you click that button, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say." Uh, I think it's self. I always confuse self and this because I switch back between C-sharp and Objective-C. Um, 
the label dot text equals this is the normal nomenclature that you find in every book for every other language. So they are like, oh, that's objective C, haha, -ha, piece of cake. And well, to do this, you'll have to go to a strange way of calling string formatting classes. So instead of that, I'm going to use the fancy iOS um, Objective C syntax, which is I'm going to call a method on this object. And it's going to be set text. Actually, uh, self dot the label dot text. And I'm going to say this is equal. So, Gus, um, while he's typing this up, what kind of uh, experience do you have with uh, Xcode, or have you messed around with it very much? I know we haven't talked about that at all uh, before. I'm just kind of curious to get your thoughts on the uh, the editor. But I haven't touched it at all, actually. Um, <clears throat> the editor looks kind of interesting, the way it's divided. Um, definitely, you would uh, you'd have to have a high-resolution monitor like uh, Retina to be able to uh, have everything on the screen. I can tell you that much. But it does remind me quite a bit of C sharp or C, so. Absolutely. Okay, so I did a quick text. I'm gonna make this size of this label a little bigger, cause. And so, just kind of revisiting here. So, um, because everything is an object in Objective C, I'm prefixing the string that I'm assigning to the text of this label with an ampersand, which is basically creating an object on the fly. Now, if you wanted to concatenate two strings, let's say we have ns string, and it's yeah, it's a pointer to a string. I'm gonna call this the first, and this is equal to uno, and then you have, and it's giving you a warning. This compiler nags you like crazy, it's like. Hey, you never, you have not used the uh, on the variable first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me one second. I'm in a demo. <laughs> and a string, and you know it has code completion, so pretty handy. You just press tab, and I'm gonna create one here called second equals second. And so you say, well, do I just do uno plus second? Um, not quite. What you have to do is is kind of something. Like say n a string, and I'm gonna call a class method called string by. Uh, actually, where's my string? Well, this is a string, so I'm gonna say string by appending string, and so I'm gonna append first, and. What's going to happen is every time I push that button, it's just going to keep appending um, text to that. <laughs> so it's just going to go, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so it's kind of a, it, there's some weirdness on, on in here. And of course, I probably messed something up. But I was just showing you nomenclature. I, I don't worry too much about syntax right now. But um, I think I've been spending too much time with JIA coding in C Sharp. Let me open a <laughs> project that I was working on most recently. Um, this is the Xcode version or incarnation of my Windows uh, Store app coming soon, hopefully. And so I have, as you can see, quite a few windows showing up here. Very cool. I um, like I like that view. That that's really neat. I like that a lot. Yeah, I do too. And so once I start pl playing here, I can select different items here so you can change properties of, of these buttons and these are controls. This is work in progress so not a lot works here so don't don't hate me. Um, if I go then it's supposed to I have this overlay that I can dismiss. It's kind of like a tutorial and then you can start learning music here. Uh, and you know you can do certain you're gonna be able to do really interesting things and you go to this other view. This is a tab controller so you have multiple views within one container and 
again, you get a lot of the navigation for free, et cetera, et cetera. So um, quick sneak peek on code. If you're just curious, there is the case nomenclature. Um, I was particularly just interested in showing you one thing before I, I finish, because I think I'm probably a bit over time. Um, just to give you an idea, when I click on this Go button, So I want to see it's automatic. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's one one thing to be careful. Sometimes you you click on on this guy, and and if it's not fully in focus, you don't get the automatic to recognize which class you're talking about. So you have to make sure it's kind of like fully here to be able to look at the right class. So this is the settings view controller, and okay, so this. As you can see, I have one action linked to multiple buttons. And I just look for a certain attribute when I press on that button to detect it. So um, how do you link multiple things? Well, you just continue control dragging on top of this function, and it links it. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, um, I think that would be a useful functional function for sure. Now, when I am going to go to the next view, and I'm going to hide the outline by clicking here, and I'm going to, if you see these three buttons here, I'm going to hide also the leftmost element, the rightmost element. So I'm, I'm now uh, working on a fully maximized window. So if I want to change the behavior when I go from this view to this view, the segue has some pre-built events or, or methods like prepare for segue. So because this window can go to multiple views, you can actually look for, hey, which segue are you trying to invoke? Oh, start game. Well, when that happens, you can actually send some data over there. Like in this case, which flashcard sets did you pick? Right, do you want to choose from? Right. Yeah, and so when you land on the other view, you can send all of that data. So pretty, pretty cool. It's really, really similar in some ways to to working in um, Windows app store app development. The thing I wanted to see you here. This is an example, and it's kind of hard to see because the the text is really tiny. But you see those um, open bracket and close bracket. Yeah. So. Here, what I'm doing is segue.identifier is the, um, it's basically this guy. Gotcha. gotcha. And I'm sending it a method called is equal to string, and then I'm comparing it to the string show progress. So, oh. in this case, I'm saying if the segue is start game, then I'm going to go here. If it's show progress, I go down here. Um, so almost like uh, like an uploading or um, you know some type of action like that, right? Yeah, and and this this is kind of customary. Uh, this is the tr the the preferred method of writing uh, calls to to methods in in Xcode. You could easily say in this if element uh, is segue dot identifier equal to blah 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 or something like that. Um, so you can you can basically write the dot notation, or you can choose this bracket convention. So this is the equivalent of saying super dot view the load parenthesis in in other languages. Sure. Just to give you the idea. Um, okay. I'm trying to find one that has some funky. Just last thing I promise. Just just some funky uh, parameters. And let me see. So the one thing that I'd like for our audience to know that is looking, uh, you know, at, at multiple um, IDEs or development, uh, because a lot of companies have strategies to build iOS apps first, and then Android, and you know, obviously Windows Phone, if uh, you know, and and that on the the hierarchy. So a lot of our audience is like, well, I want to get into doing this, and I want to kind of, I want to see what the, this is really cool for me to see it from the uh, the Xcode side. Because I'm used to seeing it from the, the Visual Studio side, or like you know maybe a Java or whatever the case may be is. So this is really interesting for um, that. And plus, you know, like Gus just said, mobility is hot now. Um, yeah. So um, 
So, okay, this is this is the last thing that I wanted cool. to to show you. Um, and I, like I told you, when when you're talking about mobility, it has really come a long way. I mean, the first time I sneak peek into this, which was in the early 2001, 2002, it, it was just so much more difficult because the the UI stuff was separate. So it, it was really hard to visualize the app as a whole. And I think now you have this seamlessly integrated experience where you're really just working here and, and everything you do is here right there and you can work really fast. Um, so here's really quickly a, a sneak preview on what does a method definition look like in Xcode with parameters. So in this case this is an initializer called init with card count colon and then you have the variable type which is a, an integer called count. As you can see, there is no parenthesis. Parameter one, type, name, comma, parameter two, name, comma, blah, blah, blah. In this case, you use this uh, init with card count, colon, using deck, colon, with how many matching cards, colon. So if we want to see what that looks like when you invoke it, um, let me go back to my main page and search. Here it is. So when you use that method to initialize an object, see how, um, well in this case, you, you there's a couple of things going on here. There's a um, nested set of methods being called on each other. So I'm allocating memory space for the card matching game and then I'm initializing it. So that's a, a golden rule in iOS. You still have to allocate a variable in memory and then you have to initialize it every time. No exceptions or you're gonna get into crappy situations. That's a lot more lower level than what you probably get with C Sharp and other higher level languages. But they have managed to not force you to do manual uh, disposal of your variables. Xcode has reference counting, so as soon as there is no reference to your object, Xcode just gets rid of it. It's not garbage collection, it's actual smart reference counting. Nice. And so here basically what we're saying is, I could just write this method like this in one line. Uh, it looks a hell lot more complicated because it's like, what? In it with card count, and this property, looking at the buttons, and just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, here's the app that I'm running. This is another app that I wrote when I took a class. It's a card matching game. So it initializes all these cards, so you can play a matching game. You can learn how to build this app if you take the free Stanford iTunes University course. And so I'm initializing the deck that is visible to the user with this many cards with a new deck and because the game has multiple modes I'm giving it a match mo matchmaking mode so in this case you can choose two or three matching cards so um, I think I'm looking at the short version of this yeah let me go to the iPhone 4 I love how Alejandro says just one more second I promise yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> So cards to match, if, if you're matching two cards, that's how this works. If you're matching three cards, I'm going to deal this game again. Now you, you're playing a three card matching game. Very cool. And, yeah. uh, and that's, that's, that's really neat. So let me undo this, see how much nicer it looks if I just align it. And, and when you say enter, it automatically aligns the columns. So Nice. Yeah, it, it looks pretty neat. I think C Sharp and Visual Studio kind of do things like that. But um, so that's a super, super, super fast overview of building an app. And uh, I could go on and on and show you more cool things. But uh, primarily, Xcode has become a lot easier and a lot less challenging to use. So let me switch this off and get back to you guys. 
Awesome. So, Gus, um, after seeing some of this stuff, do you have any questions for Alejandro? Not really. It seemed pretty straightforward. I like the way that the IDE allowed you to click and drag and <clears throat> and actually can you know bound stuff automatically because um, Visual Studio doesn't quite do it like that. I mean, it does do it to a point, but I, I like the way that the IDE is set up. I think it's kind of cool. But I do understand how I, I've heard multiple people tell me that Objective C is kind of C, but not really, mm -hmm. and it does look quite a bit different. That that's the biggest thing. Yeah, the, the syntax is definitely one of the things that will kind of throw off some people of balance because they're so used to the dot notation in the, the brackets here. You don't have to use them. You can, instead of saying object dot property equals this, you can say object dot property execute this set method something. So Apple recommends that you stick to, to the brackets and you only use dot notations for local variables and, and local property instances. It's just so that you recognize one thing from another. Um, it takes a little bit to get used to, but I think with practice you, you kind of get the hang of it. And Alejandro standing behind you going, come on! <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's called extreme programming. It's extremely annoying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so, um, so Alejandro, what, uh, what do you like? What we asked you a couple of questions at the beginning of the the show here. Um, so what? Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead. What do you see, uh, the next technological niche being? What What do you think is gonna be the next hottest thing for people to start coding towards and, um, uh, you know, working towards, you know, because uh, Gus hit on it earlier. Uh, he didn't say it, but I said a forum kind of this mo mobility is just so huge right now when it comes to developing applications. A lot of people are going to conferences, and that's one of the number one questions they ask is, you know, how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? And mobile. So um, wh what do you see the next uh, niche being? I think it's the return of the thin client. I think that we, it's kind of ironic, the, the more powerful devices are coming, the dumber they are getting too. Um, I, I think everything is going to cloud storage. It was, it was shocking when the solid state drives first came because they were so small. It's like, hey, here's a super fast drive and you can get it with 32 gigs or 64. So you're like, really? They, they fill up so fast, right? Right. And so there's all this, this like the Surface Pro 3, that, that thing is so thin. The, the MacBook Pro Retina, they're so thin, um, and, and you cannot really upgrade as easily or as cheaply as you were used to, and, and the more portable they become, they're losing the keyboard, they're going more to touch, they're, they're getting more, uh, they're, they're leveraging other services as opposed to having everything here so that you can have more battery power. Um, and they're getting to the point, you, you've seen it with OneNote and, and Office 365 primarily. You can just go from one device to another, no matter the family, mm -hmm. and open the same file, share it, edit it, create a new one. Um, so I, I think my my like like Bill Gates uh, Bill Gates said just recently. I think we're we're really living the end of the PC era now. It's it's the post PC era. Okay, cool. Well. That that's one of Gus. Do you have any uh, final thoughts that you want to uh, you want to share with our audience on this uh, this wonderful yet a little unusual because we're so used to dealing with uh, Windows development stuff uh, episode. Well, actually, I'm glad that we're out of Windows. Um, I I want to show showcase any technology that's out Absolutely. there, whether it be Unix, Windows, Mac, um, you know, iPhone, Android, yeah. whatever. I, I'm perfectly okay with Java and .NET. That being said, even Adre uh, Adrenos and all those. Yes. Oh, definitely, definitely. Any type of programming that's out there, I'm I'm cool with, even if it's a Lego bot from Robots. Yeah. That's what exactly. we. So you know, that being said, I'm glad that Alejandro was on and actually showed uh, showed some uh, Xcode because I've actually wanted to look at it and I haven't had the chance to be able to do that. So that's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. If you want to get started, Gus, and you have any questions, just know where to find me. Yes, I do. Uh, I definitely do. He's 
a part of the family. Uh, well, that uh, that wraps up the show. Um, again, you can follow us on our website at uh, stltechtalk.com. Uh, you check us out underneath podcasts. We're actually going to be changing stuff a little bit up around on the site to where we're going to have a developer section, and that's going to encompass our code cast and uh, some events that we're going to be having uh, coming up. Uh, Gus, you wanted to announce, uh, go ahead and announce some uh, upcoming events that you, you have. Well, first off, next week we have Don Felker on. Um, uh, he's an Android developer, um, uh, like open source enthusiast. Um, I, I'm not sure what we're talking about, but I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. Um, and after that, uh, you guys can actually find me at Codestock July 11th and 12th in Knoxville, Tennessee. So I'll be down there doing a talk or two uh, with quite a few of the speakers from KCDC. So awesome. come on out and say hi. Yeah, we'll see if we can uh, make it down there for maybe that one too. It's not too far away, so yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility. Um, sure. So, uh, with having said that, uh, we can't thank uh, you enough again, Alejandro, for being on the show. Um, we are going to be uh, having a podcast tomorrow night with just the STL Tech Talk group for our normal STL Tech Talk podcast. It's our last Thursday. We're doing the, we're going to start moving the shows to Tuesday nights. Um, instead of Thursdays, but we're also going to be announcing our new STL Tech Chic website. Uh, that's STL Tech and then C H I C dot com. That's going to be uh, live June first. So be looking out for that as well. That's going to be our women in tech uh, section, which I think a lot of people are going to be really excited and, and happy with. Um, and go ahead and send us feedback uh, and tell us uh, what you kind of expect out of a site like that. And I would greatly appreciate that. So having said that, guys, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, from the entire STL Tech Talk uh, crew, uh, good night and good coding. We're out.